Right, let's go ahead and get started um, in the interest of time so that you have the maximum amount of time to present Dr. Leland. Is that okay? Absolutely, thank you. Excellent. All right. Well, welcome everyone uh, to our RICMAR webinar, uh, which is an introduction to mediation and moderation concepts and methods. Our presenter this morning is Dr. Neelands. He is a professor in the Division of Prevention Science in the Department of Medicine at UC San Francisco. He is an applied data analyst and statistician, but, but most importantly, he's part of our RICMAR community. Dr. Lelands is the leader of the UCSF Center for Aging in Diverse Communities Analysis Corps and a member of the Research Education Corps. Um, he, his substantive interests include training the next generation of health equity researchers working in um, U.S. minority communities, and really has been a champion in um, trying to promote the use of rigorous statistical and analytic methods uh, for our researchers in the RICMAR program. So welcome, Dr. Leelands. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, for those of you on the line, please note that we will be holding questions until the end. We're going to allow Dr. Nilins to present and then uh, answer questions. If you have burning questions, um, please add them to the chat. And yes, we will make the slides available um, after the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Nilins. Uh, thank you, Lourdes. So, and thanks to the uh, Rickmar Coordinating Center for uh, all the organizational heavy lifting uh, in the background. Uh, you don't see it, and if you don't see it um, up front, that means uh, it was done very, very professionally and smoothly uh, behind the scenes. So it's all very transparent. So thank you all for um, doing such a fantastic job getting this uh, set up and inviting everyone. Um, so. Um, looking forward to uh, sharing what little I know about mediation and moderation with you all today. Uh, so the title of my talk is Introduction to Mediation and Moderation, Concepts and Methods, and by methods I broadly mean approaches. Um, that, that's, I think, about what we can cover in an hour. Uh, so moving along to the goals of today's talk, uh, we're going to introduce the concept of statistical mediation and methods for assessing it. And then we'll talk a little bit, there'll be a, like a dab or a smattering of the concept of statistical moderation, types of moderation, and a few limitations uh, that we typically see in moderation analyses. Uh, I do want to be upfront and, and let you all know that today's talk won't provide in-depth guidance on how to perform mediation and moderation analyses from a nuts and bolts perspective, like looking at software code and interpreting results, um, but I will point you to resources where you can learn more about these types of analyses, uh, and including how to actually pull the levers to generate results and how to interpret the results. And just a little side note, apologies in advance, um, I tend to have very text heavy slides and part of that is out of a desire to make this material accessible to folks who are attending and then want to go back and review it. Uh, and also for folks who weren't necessarily able to make it today um, and who are going to be reading the slides. So let's begin with looking at what is statistical mediation. Uh, so we might consider here an exposure X and an outcome Y. And a typical research question might ask, what is the effect of X on Y, or does X affect Y significantly? And visually, we can depict the relationship um, with a typical boxes and arrows type of arrangement where there's uh, an exposure box X on the left-hand side, and there's a single-headed arrow leading to Y, where a single-headed arrow represents an implied causal direction, i.e. X affecting Y. And then we have uh, a little italicized C there uh, sitting above the arrow. And what that C represents is the total effect of X on Y. So, you know, we do these kinds of analyses all the time uh, in a non-mediation context, but what if we thought that X affected something else that a turn affected Y that could explain the X to Y association? So that's where we have sequential mediation. And to think about sequential mediation, we introduce a new variable M that is caused by X and in turn causes Y. Uh, 
when we implicitly assume that X precedes M and M precedes Y. In other words, what we're assuming here when we set up uh, the conceptual diagram this way is we're assuming a form of temporal ordering. Uh, now, if you look at the top of the two figures here on the right-hand side, the first one is uh, just a replication of what we had on the last slide, a, a total effect of X on Y, uh, and that is labeled C. But then if you look down here at the one on the uh, lower portion of the figure panel, uh, what we see is some additional information. Uh, first of all, we notice that C has changed to C prime, and that's because C prime is the direct effect of X on Y, uh, conditional on having M in the model. Uh, we also have two other effects here because we've introduced M. We have A, which is the direct effect of the exposure X on the mediator M. So that's over here. So the X influence on M. And then we also have an effect B, which is the influence of M on Y, and both of those are considered direct effects uh, in their respective parts of the model. Now you have this X to M to Y sequencing, and that's why this model is known as the sequential mediation model. Uh, so this is a little abstract, so let's just consider a hypothetical example to help make these principles a little more concrete. So uh, I drew on a paper published by Aidan Scheim and Greta Bauer back in 2019. Um, Aidan and Greta were interested in whether experiences of discrimination mediated an association between non-white race, ethnicity, and psychological distress. And this, this is a simplified version of what they did. They had a lot more race, ethnicity categories and a more sophisticated setup, but I'm trying to introduce the principles here in, a, in the most digestible way possible. So uh, I slimmed it down a little bit. But the main question here is, could people's experiences of discrimination explain or somehow account for a previously observed link between non-white race, ethnicity, and psychological distress? And that's what we see here in the diagram. A non-white race ethnicity up here is the exposure. Uh, we have the A effect leading to the mediator, which is discrimination experiences. And then discrimination experiences could influence psychological distress along the B pathway. And then we have this C prime pathway here. That's the direct effect of non-white race ethnicity on psychological distress. Once you've accounted for the presence of discrimination experiences in the model. So when we think about the sequential mediation model, um, it was first popularized back in the mid-1980s by uh, Dave Kenny and Ruben Barron, who wrote a seminal article in 1986. Uh, and they described an approach that goes by uh, several different names. Uh, one of them is the four causal steps approach. And basically what the approach does is it fits a series of regression equations. Uh, and you have multiple steps to fit the equations and then step back and look at the various effects and determine whether mediation is present or not. So in step number one, you estimate the direct effect of X on M. So that's that A pathway. Uh, and then, you know, this, this in, the, in our little example, that would be the effect of race ethnicity on discrimination. So that's what's shown in the lower panel here uh, of the two figures. And then step two, you estimate the total effect of X on Y. So that's that C pathway we saw earlier. So that's in a model where you just have psychological distress regressed onto non-white race ethnicity, but you don't have the mediator in the model yet. Then you move to step three. And in step three, you estimate the direct effect of X and M on Y. So now that effect of X on Y, in our example, the effect of non-white race ethnicity on psychological distress, that effect is now what statisticians would call conditional on the presence of M in the model. So that's why C changes now to C prime. And you also have this effect of M on Y. So that's the B pathway here. Um, 
And that effect is the effect of race, ethnicity, and discrimination on distress. When you when you have both of those together in the model, you have these two effects. Uh, so that's a multivariable linear regression model with two predictors. And then in step four, this is the part where you step back, you look at all the results from these various regression runs, and you assess mediation by examining the A coefficient, the B coefficient, the C coefficient, and the C prime coefficient. And the way this works is, first of all, the direct effects of X on M and M on Y must be significant. So race ethnicity must significantly affect discrimination in our example, and discrimination must affect distress. And this is conceptually logical. It's, it's intuitive, right? I mean, if you want to have mediation, you, you're going to need to have the legs, the separate legs of this path, this, this overall pathway here, significant, right? So if there's no association between non-white race, ethnicity, and discrimination experiences, then how can discrimination mediate the total effect? And similarly, you're going to want to have discrimination affecting psychological distress for essentially the same reason. If you don't have that part of the pathway, um, then there's, there's no continuous flow through here um, throughout the whole pathway from non-white race, ethnicity, through discrimination experiences to psychological distress. So that's the logic of, of this third bullet here on this slide. All right, next, if the total effect C from the X to Y model is significant, but the direct effect C prime from the X plus M to Y model, so that's your multivariable linear regression model, is not significant, then it is concluded that M completely mediates the X to Y association. So if you think about this, you know, you start out with this, this two variable model, you just have race ethnicity predicting distress, there's a statistically significant association there, then all of a sudden you put in this discrimination experiences mediator, and voila, the uh, original effect goes away, then the, the four causal steps approach would say that there's complete mediation, right? That discrimination experiences variable, it completely explains uh, the previous bivariate association between non-white race, ethnicity, and distress. Now, there's another possibility here, which is that if the total effect C from X to Y is significant, and the effect C prime from the X plus M to Y model is also significant, but you know reduced in size, um, then it is concluded that M partially mediates the X to Y association. So, you know, maybe there's something about non-white race ethnicity that uh, it goes through discrimination experiences uh, to get to psychological distress to some extent, but there may be variants left over in psychological distress that non-white race ethnicity is either explaining by itself or explaining through some other mediator that you didn't include in the model um, and that's unaccounted for. So uh, just to recap in our example, the total effect of X on Y is race ethnicity to psychological distress in a, in a model without its mediator included. And then when you introduce the mediator, you have the additional A effect and the B effect, uh, and you assess whether mediation uh, occurred by what happens in, in terms of looking at the C prime coefficient. Now, some methodologists uh, such as uh, Hayes and Rockwood view this distinction between partial and full mediation as a, being a bit outmoded, and they make a few points around this having to do with sample size and power um, is one of the points that they make. So they point out, for instance, that um, the, the test of significance of these coefficients may be influenced by your sample size, and if you have a relatively small sample, it's easier to attain complete mediation because the power for testing that C prime coefficient is weaker uh, than if you had a large sample. Um, so they, they find that there is limited utility utility uh, in these concepts, but I'm sharing them here with you so that when you read the literature and you see somebody in a paper talking about partial and full mediation, um, you'll have a sense of, of what they're referring to. So 
how can we quantify the amount of mediation? So as we've been we've been already talking about visually comparing C and C prime, um, but one thing we could do to get an estimate, an actual estimate, is to subtract C prime from C. And, and this is intuitive, right? C is the total effect. You introduce the mediator, you get C prime. Uh, C prime's left over after, what's left over from the original association after you account for the mediator. Uh, so uh, you can subtract C prime from C, and uh, that's known as the difference method. Uh, and so what remains is the mediation effect uh, once you've subtracted off C prime from C. Now, an alternative is to multiply the A coefficient times the B coefficient, and that's known in the mediation literature as the product method. So how is it that we can do this two different ways and get to the same place? Uh, so in a linear regression context, the total effect of X on Y, turns out, can be decomposed into C is equal to the product of A times B plus C prime. So if you do a little algebra and you move C prime over on the left-hand side of the equal sign there, you get C minus C prime is equal to A times B. And that's the effect of mediation. And this A times B, or if you like, C minus C prime, is often referred to as the indirect effect of X on Y through M. So let's talk a little bit about the product method, uh, the A times B approach a bit more. Uh, so turns out that in a linear regression setting, as I was showing you on the last slide, there is this equivalence between A times B and C minus C prime. But for nonlinear or generalized linear models like logistic, um, multi-level models, and some other models, uh, a times B only approximately equals C minus C prime. Uh, and so it turns out A times B is more often used to quantify the indirect effect. And there's a reference for that uh, from Dave Kenny, 2021. Uh, and there are several methods for testing the significance of that A times B indirect effect. Um, my former colleague, Steve Gregorich, did a talk in 2014 where he talks about some of these. Uh, our time is limited this morning, so we can't get into a deep dive of those. But um, I will mention that because the indirect effects here are products of two coefficients, A and B, uh, they are most often asymmetrically distributed. And so what does that mean on a practical basis? Well, if an effect is asymmetrically distributed, it makes less sense to do what's usually done, which is take the estimate and divide it by its standard error, because the standard error is based on the standard deviation, and a standard deviation assumes a symmetric distribution. So what's more typically done is to calculate confidence intervals that are asymmetric, uh, and I will talk about that in a few minutes um, uh, about some methods for how you can do that. Um, but that's what's most often done for making inference uh, inferences about the significance of indirect effects. So I wanted to step back now and just talk a little bit about the causal steps method, uh, its, its impact, but also some of its limitations. So Tyler Vanderweel, who's an international expert on mediation analysis, and you'll see his name throughout my slides here, um, has mentioned that the Barron and Kenny 1986 causal steps paper has been cited over 90,000 times. Um, so this is a really seminal paper and its impact on many fields has been profound and undeniable. And I like to think of their causal steps approach as mediation version 1.0. Uh, and you'll see a little bit later that I'll talk about a 2.0 and a 3.0. So the regression-based causal steps method, um, as wonderful as it is, does have some limitations. Uh, one limitation, for instance, is that the sample is assumed to be the same for all three of those regression models. And 
as we know, in real world analytic contexts, uh, you can have missing data and that can lead to different ends for the different regression models and that can uh, be a little bit problematic. Um, the other thing is, as I mentioned, we really ideally want to compute asymmetric confidence intervals for indirect effects, um, but that's not built into most regression routines and statistical software. So if you think about it, you would have to write code to generate all the estimates and um, write them out and um, you know, use a use a method that's either analytical or resampling based like the bootstrap to calculate confidence intervals around those estimates. Uh, that could certainly be done. Uh, it probably, depending on what software you're using, might or might not be that difficult a thing to do, but there are um, newer methods that make it even easier. Uh, another thing that's a limitation with this approach is that the traditional sequential x to m to y mediation model uh, it's relatively easy to fit using the causal steps model but uh, oftentimes researchers have more complex mediation models that they'd like to look at and uh, as you increase the complexity of the model um, the difficulty of using a causal steps approach uh, increases because you have more and more equations to fit and uh, effects to keep track of. So enter mediation 2.0 structural equation modeling. So while the causal steps method was popular structural equation modeling became popular for testing mediation. And SEM, as it's abbreviated, is a simultaneous equation estimation method, which means that it can estimate all of these pathways that we've been discussing simultaneously. And I like to view uh, SEM as a mediation analysis version 2.0, and it has several advantages that make it very attractive. First of all, it can estimate each of the mediation equations simultaneously, uh, and that eliminates the problem of different ends being used to estimate the different equations in the causal steps that you get in the causal steps approach. Another thing is that most SEM software routines support convenient estimation of optimal asymmetric confidence intervals via the bootstrap. So the idea behind bootstrapping is you take samples of size n from your original sample over and over and over again. And in some samples, a, a given participant might be represented um, more than once, uh, whereas other certain other participants might not appear at all. Um, but what it allows you to do is basically by resampling and then generating that estimate over and over and over again, let's say the A times B estimate, um, you're able to build uh, an empirical distribution for what that estimate looks like. And then you can go to the tails um, at the 2.5th percentile and at the 97.5th percentile uh, and say, well, you know, that that's my confidence interval for this asymmetric indirect effect. And then, um, you, you know, that uh, helps you determine whether your uh, effect is meaningfully large. Um, you can look at whether that confidence interval includes zero or not. Um, if you really want to take a significance testing approach to it, and if that confidence interval includes zero, it would not be statistically significant at the 5% level. And if the confidence interval excludes zero, you could uh, conclude that at the 5% level, uh, that estimate is statistically significantly different from zero. So that's very convenient. And uh, SEM, most SEM packages um, make it very fast and easy to perform this kind of bootstrapping. Uh, there are other methods to get the asymmetric um, confidence interval. You can use Bayesian estimation or Monte Carlo simulation. Some SEM programs like M plus, for instance, uh, have Bayesian estimation built in. Uh, so that's, you know, it's very convenient to uh, get 95% intervals that way as well. Another advantage of SEM is that latent variables can represent shared variants among multiple correlated variables for X, M, and or Y. 
And there's research that shows uh, from Hoyle and Kenny that it, this is particularly helpful for the mediator M because it can reduce the impact of measurement error, thereby maximizing accuracy and statistical power for testing and direct effects. So that's, that's a very nice feature. Um, as well. But probably the biggest advantage among all of these is that SEM can be used to fit a wider array of models, including ones with multiple mediators uh, and or longitudinal mediation. So here are a couple of small examples. Um, on the left hand side, we have an exposure X leading to Y, but now we have two mediators postulate here that X influences Y through both M1 and M2. And, you know, whether you have M1 only or you have M2 only or you have M1 or M2 uh, together in this kind of model, when you fit it with SEM software, it's, it's, it's all very easy and you get the indirect effects um, pretty seamlessly. Uh, on the right hand side, I have what's essentially almost the same model, except now we have a pathway going from M1 to M2. So if you think about the causal flow, you could uh, start up here at X and go along the A1 pathway to M1, then go along the M12 pathway to M2, and you could then go along the B2 pathway to Y. Uh, but also simultaneously, you could go from A1 through M1 to B1 to Y, and you could go from a to uh, X to M2 through A2 and M2 to Y through B2. So you can see that uh, the SEM methodology gives you a flexible way to uh, address multiple forms of mediation. All right. So here's an example of this kind of chain mediation that we saw on the right hand side uh, in the previous slide. Um, so a uh, number of years ago, over 10 years ago now, uh, I worked with my colleagues Kyung Hee Choi and Lisa Boleg to fit a mediation model with a latent difficult sexual situations variable that was measured by three correlated indicators, um, trading sex for money, sex while drunk or high, and ex having an experience of sexual coercion. And the model showed a chain of mediation from women's experiences of sexism over here on the left-hand side uh, through psychological distress down to difficult sexual situations and then over here to the final outcome, unprotected sex. Um, sexism also had another indirect effect uh, through difficult sexual situations. Uh, however, uh, did not have an effect, uh, an indirect effect through psych distress without involving sexual situations because this, this coefficient over here um, was not statistically significant. So that's just an example of an application of the SEM approach. Another application of SEM uh, for assessing mediation is the assessment of longitudinal mediation. And um, Mitchell and Maxwell in 2013 published an article where they demonstrated that the typical sequential X to M to Y model uh, can yield biased results if it that model is taken from a setting that has additional measures of X over time, M over time, and Y over time. So if you look at this diagram here, um, the typical sequential mo um, model would have X1 leading to M2 via the A pathway here, and then M2 leading to Y3 via the B pathway. But if we were to fit that model and we had this additional information over here for X2, X3, and then M1, Y1, and Y2, you can see that we're omitting a lot of information. And the values of these pathways here from X1 to X2 and X2 to X3, uh, which we refer to as autoregressive pathways because you're essentially regressing a later time point of X on an earlier time point of X, the, the auto meaning self in this case, you're like regressing it onto itself just at an earlier time point. 
Um, those coefficients can influence what these coefficients here, the ones we care about, uh, are estimated to be. And similarly down here with y, you have y1 and y2, and then y2 to y3, that can influence um, the uh, estimates of A and B as well. So uh, you can see here that having a model that can incorporate all of this uh, can be beneficial to help reduce that type of bias. So here's a really busy diagram uh, from an analysis that uh, I did back in 2015 with my colleague Nelson Vares Diaz uh, from the University of Puerto Rico. Um, Nelson examined whether an intervention that was designed to reduce HIV AIDS stigma among uh, over 500 Puerto Rican medical students, that's the X variable, the intervention, increased positive emotions towards persons living with HIV. That's the mediator M and and here in the diagram, we have um, the positivity scores are over here, POS, T2, T3, and T4. And then there, we had this hypothesis that um, if the intervention benefited, uh, led to more positivity, more positive emotions, then you would see a corresponding reduction in stigma at later time points. And so... The way this model is set up is it looks a little different from the one on the previous slide because um, randomization group is just a it's a time constant exposure, um, but it predicts um, the positive emotions and the positive emotions predict uh, stigma at later time points and these uh, A's, these B's and these C's are um, the abbreviations for the coefficients and we've been able to impose some simplifying assumptions here. Um, for instance, we're assuming that there's a, a stable effect of uh, positive emotions at one time point on a subsequent time point. So that those coefficients are set to be the same. Same down here for stigma. We were able to set um, the coefficients from earlier stigma uh, at, to later stigma uh, to be the same over time. And then some of these coefficients in the middle, we were also able to set to be the same. And then you also have here, um, we allow the model to uh, have covariance between the residuals. That's what the E1, E2, E4. E3, E4, E5, and E6 are. Those are residual variance estimates, and these double-headed arrows represent covariance. So the details of the model are probably less important than just the take the big takeaway here is you can fit pretty complex models using SEM um, and uh, get potentially interesting results. Uh, for instance, uh, over here on the next slide, um, I just summarized that there are four waves of measurement, baseline immediately following the intervention, six months post baseline and 12 months post baseline. And then we were interested in some direct effects, in other words, whether group was positively associated with the positive emotions mediator at subsequent waves, and whether the positive emotions mediator at a previous time point was negatively associated with stigma at the current time point. And then there are key and direct, there's like one key indirect effect here of interest, which is whether group was negatively associated with stigma at the current time point through positive emotions at the previous time point. And indeed, that was the case. And the interpretation here was the intervention uh, increased positive emotions towards persons living with HIV, which in turn reduced participant stigma towards persons living with HIV. And just to recap, the approach here is arguably superior to a standard serial mediation analysis because of these autoregressive uh, and time. We also included in this model time T stigma to time T plus one positive emotions pathways. We're able to include those and control for them in the analysis. All right, um, so let's talk a little bit about some limitations of um, causal steps, which we've already covered some of those, but also SEM. And these are now bigger, more conceptual limitations. Um, and basically the, the main limitation here is that both causal steps and the SEM rest, rest on some pretty strong assumptions. And one of those is that 
uh, even if the participants, as in the last example, were randomly assigned to the exposure X, uh, or if all exposure uh, outcome confounders were controlled for, there might be still mediator outcome confounding. And I've um, included that here as a box U, and U influences M and U influences Y. Um, and that happens because we can't typically randomly assign people to levels of the mediator M. So there could be these other things floating out here that affect M to y, M and Y and, and thereby affect the M to Y estimates. Uh, and as I say down here at the bottom, you might represent one or many variables observed or unobserved. Uh, so what's the problem? Well, Uncontrolled confounders can bias analysis effect resultation of the traditional regression and most SEM based approaches is their assumption of no interaction uh, between either the exposure and the mediator or uh, the exposure and other potential confounders. So ideally, we'd like to be able to investigate and account for such interactions if in fact they are present. And finally, as if that weren't enough, um, there are some ad hoc methods that have been advanced for non-continuous mediators and outcomes, but it would really be helpful to have a more general framework that allows for non-continuous mediators uh, and or outcomes. So causal mediation methods happily address these issues. They extend traditional regression and SEM-based methods to allow non-continuous M and Y variables, and they also allow interactions. Uh, and I think a really nice readable article on this is by Valerian Vanderweel in 2013, and they also supply SAS and SPSS macro programs for uh, performing causal mediation analyses for sequential mediation models. Um, in SAS, there's also Proc Causal Med, uh, which is based on the Valerian Vanderweel work, um, but is act an actual bona fide procedure. And then there's a user written command in Stata called Paramed that implements this method. And then um, there are various R based commands that are available as well. And Valente's 2020 article summarizes uh, the software options. So I like to call them Causal Mediation, Mediation version 3.0. And it takes a different approach from traditional mediation methods. Um, rather than fitting parametric regression equations uh, or structural equation models, what it, it does is it invites us to consider a thought experiment. In an ideal experiment, we would like to randomize everyone to an exposure X at level zero of X, for instance, a control experience, and also level one of X, in other words, like an intervention experience. And assuming an outcome Y, we'd also like to ideally be able to observe the value of Y at X equals zero. And we're gonna call that Y zero here. And also at X equals one, which we'll call Y one. Now, in reality though, if you think about it like a randomized study, for instance, you can only randomize a given individual to either X equals zero or X equals one, but not both unless it's like a within subject design or something. But in a typical between subjects RCT, you can only randomize them to one condition. So if someone was randomized to X equals zero or observed at X equals zero in a non-randomized study, <clears throat> Y zero is observable, but Y one is not. And it is referred to as sometimes as a potential outcome or a counterfactual. And then the same thing is true for the X equals one as well. But the neat trick here is that if you average across all study participants, you can estimate a treatment effect um, Y1, and you can estimate a treatment effect uh, or control effect Y0, and you can take their expected value uh, uh, as the difference between them. And how this uh, inf affects mediation is you can compute this same effect at different levels of a mediator M. So, in the causal mediation literature, there tend to be six causal mediation effects, and the underlying logic here is that you basically just look at all, all possible. So basically what you do is you uh, first consider a total natural indirect effect, and that is 
the effect of x on y through m when the direct effect is held constant at the treatment level x equals one. So you can see in here, um, you see that uh, there's y1 and y1 over here, and then m1 minus m0 over here. Now, if we move down to the next causal effect, you have the PNIE, that's the pure natural indirect effect. That is the effect of X on Y through M when the direct effect is held constant at the control level X equals zero. So over here now, it's, it's like the previous equation, but now instead of Y1, we have Y0 in here. All right, then the next two, consider what happens if we keep um, the mediator fixed at a specific value, but uh, we vary the y values. So here, this total natural direct effect is the effect of x on y when the mediation effect is held constant at its naturally observed treatment level m equals one. And then you have the pure natural direct effect down here, where now instead of m1 and m1, you have m0 and m0. And this is the effect of X on Y when the mediation effect is held constant at its naturally observed control level, M equals zero. And then it turns out that the total effect, you can get to that by, um, that's uh, the expected value of Y1, M1 minus Y0, M0. And you can get that by summing either the total natural uh, direct effect or the pure natural and the pure natural indirect effect or the um, pure natural direct effect and the total natural indirect effect. And thank goodness we have software that will do all that for us. Now there's also a sixth effect called the uh, control direct effect. It's less frequently used. Basically what the CDE does is it asks what is the uh, expected value of Y1 minus Y0 at some specific value of capital M, which we call here little m. And that's most useful for answering what if policy type questions. So if we change the value of the mediator to some specific level little m, what would the effect of X on Y be when we do that? And if you're going to do that, M needs to be set to some kind of meaningful value. So causal mediation methods do generally assume no one observed confounding between the X to Y, X to M, and M to Y relationship. Um, but they do allow for inclusion of observed confounders. Um, and the causal mediation literature does propose sensitivity analysis methods to evaluate whether any remaining uncontrolled confounding is an issue. Uh, there is off-the-shelf software available for the X to M to Y sequential model, as I was mentioning a few slides back. Uh, examples have also been published for specific scenarios. So, for instance, there's an article by Bind et al. Uh, that talks about causal mediation analysis for longitudinal data with an exogenous exposure. Uh, for an extensive deep dive into causal mediation, uh, I highly recommend Tyler Vanderweel's articles. He published a number of them uh, up until 2015, and uh, he continues to publish more after that. But what he did with the articles prior to 2015 is he rolled them all up in as chapters in a very thick textbook uh, on mediation. So if you're interested, you can get the whole book or you can read the constituent and articles. Now, here's an interesting application of uh, causal mediation analysis, and that is um, something called post-exposure confounding. Uh, so far, we've been assuming there are no post-exposure covariates that are affected by the exposure uh, and in turn affected by the mediators and outcomes. Uh, in intervention studies, though, you can have a situation where intervention affects some kind of post-treatment covariate that in turn affects one or more of the mediators. Um, so this means that the exposure mediator relationship down here, Tx to M to Y, is confounded by uh, one or more of these treatment-induced confounders. Now, this can also occur in observational studies, not limited to intervention trials. Uh, and I like to think of this as you're, you're introducing a, another mediator in this process that comes in between the treatment and the uh, mediator that you care about or the focal mediator. So here's an example. Um, 
if we look at a study of the relationships between parental job loss and children's subsequent behavioral outcomes conducted by Mari and Kaiser uh, last year, uh, here the exposure is parental job loss and the outcome over here on the right is child behavior. We have some mediators of interest, including family income level and negative parenting down here at the bottom. But there could be post-exposure confounders, including parental separation, family moving, and they also included birth of a sibling. I didn't put that in the diagram um, because it was getting too cluttered. Um, and the good thing is there's a new state of command called RWR Med. It's a community contributed command that can be used to perform this type of analysis where you account for post-exposure confounding. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this slide, um, but it just basically summarizes what I discussed um, in, uh, in the uh, previous slide. Um, this community contributed command is, is by Lyndon et al. Um, it's in the reference list if you're interested in it. Um, and it tells what this slide tells what it can estimate um, and mentions that various other approaches are being developed for this type of situation as well. So finally, um, few to wrap up the mediation section with a few considerations. Um, if you're designing your study and you're in the, the unusual but happy situation that you can randomize both X and M, that's fantastic because that will help you make the strongest possible causal inferences because you can eliminate confounding. Um, and there is a study design technique called MOST, the multi-phased optimization strategy that allows you to use a factorial design to look at various intervention components and a multi-component intervention to tease apart which ones, either singly or in combination, um, work to uh, benefit the outcome rather than relying on post hoc mediation analysis to try and figure that out. Um, it is unusual that you're in a position to be able to do that, though. So at the study design stage, carefully consider potential confounders of those X to Y, X to M, and X to, uh, or yeah, I see there's a typo here. I have X to Y twice, but that third one should be M to Y, uh, and plan to measure them whenever possible. Uh, and then you also want to think about the timing of when you measure your mediators um, and their subject matter knowledge is really important. Like, do you expect an intervention to affect your mediators quickly or maybe more slowly? And then, as I mentioned before, cross-sectional analysis of X to M to Y may yield biased results. Um, some reviewers and journals will accept cross-sectional mediation results as long as you state those limitations, but others won't. So it kind of depends on the discipline and the specific journal where you're going. All right, let's just do a little bit on moderation, switch gears a little bit. Moderation occurs when the effect of one variable on another, say X on Y, is changed by a third variable, which I'm going to call mod here. And in health disparities research, that is often race ethnicity. Moderation is some kind, sometimes called effect modification by epidemiologists and public health researchers and statistical interactions by biostatisticians. The moderator can be continuous or binary, and the diagram at right contains a little representation of um, the X to Y relationship modified by the inclusion of this moderator called mod. And there's a critical limitation here with moderation analysis, which is that typically you're going to need many more participants uh, to have good statistical power for, to test for the significance of interaction or moderator effects relative to testing main effects. Uh, some Articles say four times as many, others say even more than that. Um, so for that reason, in my experience, a lot of moderation analyses are often proposed to be more exploratory in nature because it's very resource intensive to um, power studies to uh, have moderator, moderator analyses be a primary analysis. And it's worth thinking about when you think about interactions that there can be different patterns. And here are a few uh, examples, a uh, little trivial example. If we look at mean energy level reported by people who consume no coffee versus coffee, uh, in this first panel, if we think about, if we consider like uh, male and female subgroups, um, 
we could have uh, a parallel line here where each gender is increasing by 10 units. Um, it's just where they start and where they finish are shifted by an equivalent amount. Um, 10 unit increase for men, 10 unit increase for women. It's just women start higher and finish higher. Uh, you can have a crossover interaction pattern, which is where here the females start at 20 and drop to 10, or as the males start at 10 and climb to 20. Or you can have a one cell different scenario where for the males, they stay at 10, regardless of whether they drink coffee or not. But the females, uh, if they don't drink coffee, they're at 10, but they climb to 20 if they consume coffee. Um, there are many other possibilities, especially when there are more than two levels of each factor or the predictors are continuous. Uh, but the general rule is if these lines here are not parallel, uh, there is um, interaction present. So over here and over here. But if the lines are parallel, as in this first panel on the left-hand side, there is no interaction present. And usually when we set up interactions, we specify multiplicative interactions in which X and mod are multiplied to yield a product term that's included in our models along with the X and mod main effects. Uh, when Y is continuous and you're using a linear model, the X times mod multiplicative interaction will yield identical results to comparing the estimated means from the model directly at different levels of X and mod. But when Y is not continuous, for instance, when it's binary, that equivalence no longer holds. And thus, epidemiologists and public health researchers have been increasingly interested in what are called additive interactions, where you study the interaction on the probability scale rather than on the log odds or log risk scale. And uh, there's a nice Vanderweel and Null article that talks about this and a um, nice slide deck online that's very readable that introduces this topic. And lastly, you can combine moderation and mediation. So um, on the left-hand side here, we have mediated moderation, and that's when an interaction or moderation effect is mediated by a mediator. So here you have your, your mod and it's mediated by M, whereas moderated mediation occurs when an indirect or mediational effect is moderated or by another variable. So here we have the X to M to Y relationship that we looked at earlier, but now you have mod affecting this A pathway and this B pathway. Uh, and here is an example of how you could take a conceptual model and think about moderated mediation. Um, this is a study from one of our CADC scholars looking at um, uh, older uh, black men's uptake of COVID vaccine. And you have on the left hand side here various conceptual factors and on the right hand side various individual level factors. Uh, and the general setup is that contextual factors could be the X's, which lead to individual factors, um, which are the M, which in turn leads to this binary vaccine uptake over here on the right. Uh, you have multiple mediators in a binary Y, so you could try a SEM model, uh, or you could break out individual subparts and fit X to M to Y causal mediation models. And over here, um, we consider taking a few of the variables from the previous slide. Perhaps you might consider looking at an X, social networks. Does the number of social networks you have affect your level of social support, which in turn affects your vaccine uptake? That's a simple sequential mediation model. You can make it fancier um, using some of the principles we talked about with SEM, um, social networks leading to vaccine uptake, but you have a couple of latent variables here, health measured by health status and lifestyle, and psychosocial uh, latent variable measured by social support and psychological variables like, say, depression or anxiety. Um, and then you can take this even further and you can expand it to have uh, moderation by age. So this takes the simpler model, the social networks to social support to vaccine uptake and moderates the A pathway and the B pathway by age. And I'm moving a little quicker here because I know our time is, is running short. Um, I will uh, 
forego walking through each of these resources. Um, you can read about them later, but they are uh, excellent, especially anything um, produced by Tyler Vanderweel, who's really one of the leading lights in this area. So to wrap up, um, from a study design standpoint, don't, don't just assume there's nothing you can do to improve the study design. Um, try to randomly assign mediators as well as exposures, but realistically that, that's often difficult. So when you incorporate non-randomized mediators, which is usually the case, consider measurement timing and making sure to measure as many confounders as you can. For sequential X to M to Y models or models with post-exposure confounding, you've got causal mediation methods that are readily available in software. Um, that's especially true if you want to look at non-continuous M or Y variables uh, or interactions, um, especially exposure to mediator interactions. Uh, for multiple mediator and longitudinal scenarios, you can check the literature for new or emerging causal mediation options as they become available. Uh, otherwise, SEM can be an accessible approach as, as long as you consider the limitations. And then just a restatement about moderation analyses requiring a lot more participants to achieve satisfactory power for detecting effects. Um, you'll need sufficient N if you want to make that a primary analysis. And there are a number of citations here, and I'd like to thank my slide reviewers and thank all of you for attending this morning. And we have a few minutes for questions, so I'm happy to um, take any burning questions and then um, try to answer unanswered questions uh, in writing later. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, Dr. Neelands. We really appreciate um, all of the information you have shared with us this morning. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, uh, we'll start with um, some questions from Mr. McKenzie um, about uh, interpreting coefficients and goodness of fit. I don't know if you can see his questions in the chat or Mr. McKenzie, if you would like to uh, ask your question. Well, yeah, I, I think that uh, the, the interpretation of the coefficients is of course important, but when one <clears throat> sees uh, complex diagrams uh, of the type that we've been shown today in, in a remarkably clear presentation, I must say, uh, I'm always led to uh, attempt to remove arrows uh, in, in the diagram and to simplify the process. It seems to me that this is uh, a natural part of, of blocking off pathways and, and looking at the fit of the model. Yes, you can absolutely do that. And I think uh, that is pretty common practice, um, you know, subject to the limitations that when you make post hoc modifications to a model um, that you can increase the um, sample specific nature of the results. So the more modifications you make, the, the harder it may be to replicate that model. But um, if you're in a position to remove, you know, pathways that really are, are just contributing noise more than signal, I think it's a pretty common practice to do that. And then if you can take that final model and ideally replicate it in a new sample, um, that's yeah. really the strongest approach if you can. Yeah, there's another thing I w wanted to ask, ask you about, uh, uh, and that was uh, latterly when you were talking about causal inference and you were looking at potential outcomes, uh, many of the um, uh, calculations I think that you were proposing are based on the observational data uh, itself, so that if you're holding something at, at a treatment level and you're looking at an outcome, for example, you could think of lung cancer survival uh, and you have treatment. And uh, then you, you have, um, that, which would be, uh, I guess, in a certain sense, the mediator, because you have maybe several covariates, which you think influence survival. And treatment in this case is one of them. But in your sequential diagram, it would make sense to view treatment as a mediator, uh, in in the sense that you want to evaluate the effect of treatment, but you have these uh, these covariate effects, and you're really interested in the covariate effects. 
but treatment is also also a function of the same covariance because the doctors, when treating the patient, will look at the covariance to determine the treatment and whether the patient is uh, able able to be treated and which treatment would be best. So yes. When you're looking uh, in that set of circumstances, the treatment is built in and the survival data that you have to hand, i.e. the whys, they, are, they have been influenced, affected by, by the treatment. So averaging over those effects uh, is really, really, I think, not very relevant. What is, what is really required there is uh, randomized data which are free from the effect of selection. So the kind of um, remedy proposed by the causal inference uh, groups, I don't think I don't think is fully justified there. Yeah, I really appreciate you mentioning this, and uh, for for several reasons. One is, um, yeah, I mean, I think your if if yes, things can affect the the the, the quote unquote exposure, um, and I've been assuming throughout my talk that you know the exposure is the most upstream of the variables. But you're absolutely right. In a health setting, you can have, and in other settings, you can have um, covariates that influence both the treatment and subsequent mediators and the outcome. So, and yes, if you if you have unmeasured confounding, you can't take that into account or can't take it into account very well. Then the estimates, um, even if you use a causal mediation approach, it's not magic. It won't fix. Um, it won't fix a situation where you lack the information to uh, achieve reasonable estimates, and that's definitely a limitation of all of these causal inference approaches. And I remember attending a lecture from a big causal inference person years ago who said, you know, I mean, he's developed some of the cutting edge methods in it, and he said it's not going to replace randomized experiments because randomized experiments are the gold standard, and it's because you can control for those measured and unmeasured confounders. So I, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. And then the other thing that I'm really glad you mentioned is survival, which is something I didn't really talk about in this presentation. Again, you know, not enough time, but Tyler Vanderweel's group has um, produced several papers about how to do uh, mediation using survival models uh, and survival outcomes. And he's built some SAS macros for performing those kinds of analyses in a survival setting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much. That was a great talk. Well, thank really you. Enjoyed it. Great questions. Are Dr. There... Lance, there are a number of other questions in the chat, but um, in the interest of time, I think we will stick to your recommendation to respond to those via writing. Um, and we will post them on our website. We will include them when we share the link to the, today's recording. Does that sound okay? That sounds great. And I apologize for running so long. As usual, I had more to say than time to say it. And I hope that, I know I sped up at the end. I hope that was uh, still, just that people still got a lot of value from the session and uh, we'll have the slides and the recording that folks can go back and review. Um, why, don't, why don't you come back and uh, pick a topic and give another one? <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, that's the best possible endorsement uh, <laughs> that, it was, that it was good if you're, if you're willing to suffer another presentation from me. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. We will get a, a we will send out to folks that registered for today's webinar a link to the recording as well as the document uh, that we will create with the question and answers. We will also post the recording and the document on our website in case folks did not register for today's webinar and still want to access the information. So again, thank you for attending today, and we look forward to scheduling another Analysis Core webinar in 2023. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Nealens. Thank you all. So I will wait. I guess I'll. Uh, you guys will send me the um, questions uh, in email or. Yes, we will. In a Word uh, we'll doc. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, we'll uh, capture the questions from the chat and we'll send those to you directly. Wonderful. And you'll send us your slides.
Yes, I will do that. I have something to fix and then I'll send them to you. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. <laughs> yep. All right. Thank you guys again uh -huh. for, for all the great organizing. Of course, our pleasure. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Just out of curiosity, what was our final um, tally of people who actually joined today? 60. 60. Oh, that's good. That was excellent. Yeah. All right. Thanks. We'll be in touch. Okay. Sounds good. Bye-bye.